Hi, this is Rabbi Hyman Kaufman. Welcome to our 236th installment in the Torah portion of the week. We are holding my parashas Kiseitse. Kiseitse talks about the wayward son. We call the Ben Sora Mora. Talks about the concern of property of others. Uh, men not wearing women's clothing and vice versa. Sending away the mother bird. And taking the eggs. Forbidden and restricted marriages. A lot of very interesting uh, topics over here. So the Torah tells me in chapter 25, chapter 25, verse 9, here the Torah says, we're talking about the laws of Yibum, that's uh, what we call Leverite marriage, where a husband dies without having children. So if he's got a brother, a brother should marry the sister. They have a boy, you name the son after the husband that died, right after the brother that died. So in chapter 25, verse 9, it says, Then the sister-in-law shall approach him before his eyes of the elders, shall remove his shoe from his foot, spit before him. She, she shall speak up and say, So is done to the man who will not build the house of his brother. Now normally, we would say, Let him do evil, live right marriage. But since people won't do it for the sake of heaven, so we do this thing called chalitza. It doesn't really come up so often. And when it does, it's totally publicized so people can see it. But in general, in general, this is what we do. Right? You have a, you know, you have a certain shoe. And she takes off the shoe. Or she takes his shoe, puts it in front of him. And she spits. Right? She spits. Now, a little bit, you know, a little bit strange, this whole, you know, this whole process. But the fact is that by what we call chalitza, that's what you do. Because we don't do ever right marriage anymore. So, says Moi Verebi, Arav Agon, Ramosh, this should be well. And he says, and he brings down from Rabbi Svi Rabinovich, who is the Rav Mikovna. And he had a discussion with one of the Meskilim, one of the, you know, Jews that went away from Torah, you know, doesn't believe in Torah, you know, etc. One who believes, you know, you just go after what your mind tells you, you know, you go after what society does, whatever. So they had a conversation with one of these people uh, when he was the outbase of Kovna. Right, when he was the head of the base of the rabbinical court in Kovno. Now, what did, what did one of them tell him? One of them tells him, come on. They wanted to nullify this mitzvah of Chalitza. Because really, the Allah is, he should marry his sister. The brother, dead brother's brother, should marry, should marry his sister-in-law. And have a child where the child's name is going to, you know, she has a son. Be named after dead brother. We don't do that today. Because people are not going to do it for the sake of heaven. So we do chalitza. And by doing chalitza, this is what we do. Right? You take the shoe, the woman spits. So what did he say? He said, let's do away with this. Yeah, well, what was the claim? The claim was, you know, what a disgrace. We're much more modern. Much more sophisticated. What a disgrace to do this mitzvah. Isn't it bad enough? You know, the, the, the woman hasn't had any children. Isn't it bad enough? And now you're going to have her come. You're going to have her spit in front of him. Right? What a disgusting thing. Right? That's going to be the claim. You know, we're much more modern. How can we do this? Right? Totally disgusting. So what did Rabbi Rabinovich answer? He said, he said, I'm willing to nullify it. I would be willing to nullify it under one condition. Right? Under one condition. And if you fulfill, so he's talking, you know, to the secular wayward Jew over here. And he says, I'm willing to do it. You fulfill one condition. One condition is all I ask. So... So he says, okay. He says, what, what, what do I need to do? 
What do, you know, what do you want me to do over here? So says, says Rabbi Ravanovich, and he says, he says, I want you to go to the doctors. Go to a lot of doctors, however many it takes, and convince them that they should rid the world of death. Right? He tells him, I want you to go. I want you to go to these doctors. And I want you to tell them to rid the world of death. And that people should live forever. Right? Fame! I'm gonna live forever. Right? Fame! Let, them live, let people live forever. Let them come up with a cure for a way to people to live forever. So, this person looks at the Rav. You know, like he's crazy. He's like, How in the world could you say such a thing? Doctors are in control. Doctors can stop death from the world. Right? How is that possible? How is it possible for doctors to stop death? Right? That's the question. How can they do that? So he's telling the Rav, essentially, it's a foolish question. You can't get the doctors to do that. That's impossible. So Rabbi Ravanovich answered, so too over here. We know, as the Torah tells us, and the rabbis explain, we know what we're supposed to do over here. We know what Halit is supposed to be. That the whole point is to cause the soul of the dead person to come back, right? To be named after by the other child. Okay. You tell me we don't do it. Because they don't do it for the sake of heaven. But still, if that's what the Torah tells us, and this is what we know, how can I nullify it? How in the world can I nullify it? Because the reality is, where do we get this mitzvah from? Do we make it up on our own? I mean, it's kind of hard to say, right? Because 80% of the Torah doesn't make sense logically. So how can you say, even if it's written by man, we made it up by ourselves? Where does it come from? It comes from Mount Sinai. And the fact that it comes from Mount Sinai, was the Torah tell me? Many, many times, like the Bereshem of Moshe Lemur, God spoke to Moshe saying, or God spoke to Moshe and Aaron saying, say to the Jewish people, blah, blah, blah. Now, if this came from Mount Sinai, and this is unbelievably holy. And everyone agrees the Jewish people got the Torah at Mount Sinai. Three million people. No other no other religion, quote unquote, has ever tried to duplicate that because obviously they can't. But because of our limited understanding, you know, the fact that mitzvahs fix up the world, spiritual worlds, etc., and all the positive influence that it has in the world. And you think in our puny brains, we should nullify it. Right? This is what Rabbi Rabinovich answered. You know, just like doctors cannot stop death. Impossible. They don't have the capability. So he's saying, do we understand? Do we understand the depth of Torah? Do we understand the fact that it's God-given? Many, many proofs it's God-given. But don't we understand if it's God-given, God understands? God knows the depths of what the mitzvahs are, what they fix up, what they do for the world. So somebody doesn't see it that way. And they don't believe that way. It's a hard sell. They have to be able to admit that we have limited understanding. Doesn't mean we just believe and have perfect faith. Judaism is about belief with knowledge. But at the end of the day, the end of the day, we have to know what we're doing. 
We have to know what the halacha is. We have to understand God knows what's best for us. Ah, you don't think so? You think maybe the Torah is cruel in different ways? Is the Torah God given? If it's God given, don't you think an almighty being knows what's best for man? I would think that's the case. But if you want to say it's man made, right? Why would they, why would man make up things that don't make any sense? If I was going to write the Torah, I would write fewer laws and laws that made sense. Not laws that don't make any sense. You know, and this looks kind of disgusting, as, the, as this Moskill said. It looks pretty gross. You're going to get this woman, she's probably an older woman. Right? You're going to sit there and make her spit. I mean, it is kind of gross. You know, if it's God-given, don't you think God understood what these mitzvahs do? Even if we, even if we don't understand them, doesn't mean we don't have to. Right, means we have to work hard to try and understand. But at the same time, don't we have to work hard to try and understand? But see, too many people think they know better than God. They understand God's psyche. They understand what's in God's mind and why he did certain things. But oh, certain things look cruel. You know, they look anti, you know, maybe they're anti-pig. Maybe they're anti-non-Jews. Maybe they're anti all kinds of things, the Torah. Maybe. We just have an image problem. But if someone actually learns the Torah and understands what it's about in the bigger picture, you don't have these questions. Doesn't mean you're not allowed to question. Right? But if it's a God given book, don't you think by process of elimination, if we believe it's God given, God knows a heck of a lot more than us. God understands more than us. Now, does that mean I bow down to it without trying to understand it? No. But I have to treat it with respect. I have to try and understand it. But it's not a cop out to say, you know what, I don't get it. I just, I don't understand it. But it doesn't matter, I still have to keep it. So the Torah in some ways may look cruel. Maybe. The end of the parsha speaks about Amalek. It says to wipe out Amalek. King Saul's given a command, chapter 15, in Samuel 1. The whole thing there, the prophet, Shmuel Anavi, Samuel the prophet comes to him and says, in the name of God, destroy Amalek. Everything, just wipe them out. Now, everybody agrees who the prophets are, who our prophets are. Everyone agrees Shmuel and Navi, Samuel the prophet, the prophet. Pretty clear. Now, if he's a prophet, he can't make things up on his own. He's doing what God tells him to say. That He's conveying a message, like all prophets. Now, if we all agree he's a prophet, what he's saying comes from God. If what he says comes from God, and God says, wipe them off the face of the map. Everybody! What would somebody say without knowing very much? That's cruel. Women, what they do over here? Children, they didn't do anything wrong. Seemingly they didn't do anything wrong. So what's the issue? There's something deeper going on. Kids say, wow, God is cruel. Right? It's very easy to say without looking into the facts. What does Amalek represent? Amalek represents the fact that they don't believe they don't believe in the supernatural. Right? How do I know? The story tells me. Remember in chapter 25, verse 17. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way you were leaving Egypt. Verse 18 happened upon the on the way. Right, they struck those of you who were hindmost, all the weaklings of the rear, when you were faint, when you exhausted, did not fear God. So you wipe out their memory. So the Torah says, chap, uh, chapter 25, verse 18, that which happened upon on the way. What does it mean, happened on the way? Over there it means a chance happening. So the commentaries tell us, 
Amalek does not believe in the supernatural. Everything by them is chance. There is no such thing as God or even a God that looks over mankind, takes care of man, takes care of the world. They don't believe in the supernatural, period. And they bring cynicism and doubt to the world. Now, that very much still exists. And that's bad. That takes God out of the world. So again, person will say, okay, they're bringing that bad philosophy to the world. So God says, you know what? I want you to wipe the whole thing out. I want you to wipe everything out. Men, women, the women are bringing children into the world with that philosophy. So God says, I want you to wipe it out. Now today we can't do that. Why can't we do it? Because we don't know who Amalek is. Son Cherif came, mixed up all the nations. We don't know who Amalek is. But don't you think if that is bad, if we understand that philosophical outlook which takes God out of the world, right, and, and bringing out a cynical world that does not believe in a supernatural being, isn't that bad for the world? It's bad for the world. We want to bring godliness back to the world. Belief in God, right, obviously our God, not anyone else's God. But with all that, God gave a command. And he says, I don't want this philosophy in the world. Now, someone can come along and say, what's the big deal? Live and let live. Why be so against idolatry? Why is idolatry so bad? Many, many verses, Thor tells me. Don't worship idols. Don't bow down to them. Don't make them. Don't have them in your house. Many, many things. So you're going to say, why would God care? Why does God want to wipe all these people out? Because it takes away godliness in the world. Because of going after false gods. Going after false gods is not about living and let live. That is not what the Torah is about. The Torah is about right and wrong. The Torah says you do the right thing, good, you get reward. You do the wrong thing, there's payback. Even if you want to say it's written by man, what do they mean by that? What do they mean when there's right and wrong? How do you define right and wrong? It's got to be a universal standard. can't just be whatever I think. can't just mean morality is relative and it changes whenever I want. doesn't mean that. Because then no one's going to keep it. No one's going to worship it. Right? No question. We see that today. People think it's made up. What do they worship? Whatever they want. But you see, the onus is on you. You want to believe in that philosophy? Show me. I want someone to show me in the Torah itself. In the prophets itself, where I'm allowed to pick and choose. Don't tell me that's my world outlook. I don't care what your world outlook is. It's irrelevant what your world outlook is. Show me a source. Show me where the Torah tells me I'm allowed to do this. Don't tell me I think it's cruel. I don't care what you think. It's irrelevant what you think. It's irrelevant what I think. Is the Torah true or not? Did God give the Torah or didn't he give the Torah? You know, yes or no, don't give me in between answers. So over here, that's what he's saying. Rabbi Robin over just saying, okay, you know, so let the doctors get rid of, of death. Oh, they can't do that? Why not? They don't have the capability. Well, we don't have the capability either. We don't have the capability to uproot Torah at any level. In our puny minds, we think we understand. We know what the Torah wants. Okay, we have rabbinic law to tell us. You know, what the verses mean. Who gives us the right to uproot it? Where do I see in the Torah any source I can uproot it? You know, I don't like it, just get rid of it. And I'm allowed to pick and choose. If you tell me you pick and choose, I don't have any arguments. That's not going to bother me. What bothers me is people think they have knowledge, or even if they don't have knowledge, that's my world outlook. Okay, but that doesn't answer the question. Having a world outlook does not mean the Torah is not true. And that de facto the Torah is written by men. Where, where does it say that? Where's the proof? I'd love to see proof. Rabbi, Rabbi Novich wanted to see proof. Where am I allowed to uproot things? Who gives me the right to do that? Nobody. 
Doesn't say in the Torah, not the prophets, not the writings. Nowhere. So show me. I'm more than open. You know, to listen. You know, show me where in the Torah it says that. Show me where in the Torah that's not God given. Show me other sources that's not God given. But just because a person has an agenda and a world view in no way or shape or form tells me that the Torah is not true. So I want to remind everyone, I give a class in Truth is the Heart every Tuesday, 9 o'clock Eastern Time. We're in the gate of self, uh, self-accounting. <laughs> I also have a class in the book of Leviticus every Sunday, 9 o'clock in the morning Eastern Time, 4 o'clock Israel Time. We're in chapter 15. Just out of chapter 15. I have two Q&As every, uh, every Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, 10 o'clock Eastern Time. 5 o'clock Israel Time. I do Tanakh Talk. I was doing it every Monday. 9 o'clock uh, Israel Time. 2 o'clock Eastern Time. But now we have a conflict. I'm going to try and figure out another day to do it, hopefully. Uh, Perke Alvos every Saturday. 2.30 Eastern Time. 9.30 Israel Time. And I have conversion classes. Uh twice a week. Anyone interested in any of that, find me on Facebook, Beyond Orthodox Conversion Judaism. You can send me an email or rabbichaimkoffman at gmail.com. R-A-B-B-I-C-H-A-I-M-C-O-F-F-M-A-N at gmail.com.